With a focus on advancing emergency care, Zoll delivers innovative user-friendly technology designed for where and how you work and for the patients who rely on the care you provide. Zoll is committed to helping you save more lives. Uh, thank you very, uh, very much, Mr. Chairman, for the introduction. Um, now, I think if you were to look at your program, the title of my talk in your program is called um, Novel or Anticoagulants, The Great Reversal. I must admit that I did not choose that uh, title, especially the part of uh, uh, The Great Reversal, because when you have to reverse something, it's almost like writing a wrong. So it's never really a great thing to reverse, to having to reverse something. So I changed the title a little bit. And uh, more so, I will be focusing on the patients who present to the emergency department who is on direct oral anticoagulants and who comes in, obviously, with a uh, bleeding uh, issue to the emergency uh, department. Now, for the purpose of the talk, of course, direct oral anticoagulants, or DORAX, would be used interchangeably with another term that you might have heard, which is novel oral anticoagulants, or NORAX. Now, obviously, the, um, the class of drugs called NORAX or DORAX has been in use for coming to close to a decade already. And the use of the term uh, novel, of course, is probably inappropriate because it's no longer novel when it's been around for close to a decade. So DORAX, as we call it, of course, refers to two classes of drugs. The first class, of course, is direct thrombin inhibitors, of which there's one representation here, which is dabigatran. And the second class, of course, is the factor 10A inhibitor, of which is represented by apixaban and rivaroxaban in Singapore. Right. In other jurisdictions, of course, the other um, member of the group uh, that belongs to the group of factor 10A inhibitors, of course, is edoxaban. But in Singapore, edoxaban is currently not available. Now, the subject, of course, of reversal of uh, direct oral anticoagulants or DORAX, of course, is relevant because we were to look at it. The very first time in Singapore that we used DORAX was back in 2008. And at that point in time, of course, Dabigatran was available for usage in Singapore, but it was only available for one indication, and that is for the prevention of venous thromboembolism in orthopedic patients undergoing major orthopedic uh, surgical procedures. Now, over the past seven years, the indications as well as the number of DORAX that's uh, been introduced into the Singapore market has increased incrementally as well as the indication. And you can see that generally, for all three of the DORAX that's available, they are all indicated for the prevention of venous thromboembolism in orthopedic surgical patients. They are used for the treatment and prevention of venous thromboembolism as well as pulmonary embolism, DVT or pulmonary embolism, and also uh, atrial fibrillation, prevention of strokes in atrial fibrillation. The only difference between the three anticoagulants, of course, is that for rivaroxaban, there's also an added indication whereby it is used for the prevention of cardiovascular deaths for patients uh, suffering from acute coronary syndrome. So the, the indications have ex ex expanded, the number of uh, available agents has also expanded, and in, so in, in, in the process itself, the number of patients who are on the DORAX has been incremental over the past five years. So it's likely that at some point in time, you will see some patients uh, presenting to the emergency department with bleeding complications. Because we can see from the uh, available clinical studies, especially from the uh, phase three clinical studies on the DORAX, they are highly effective, of course, in the prevention of thrombotic complications uh, for patients with atrial fibrillation, similarly for patients uh, with uh, venous thromboembolism as well. But because they are effective anticoagulants, for it to be effective, the downside of any anticoagulants, of course, is that you have to put up with leading complications. And you look at the phase three studies, both NORAX as well as warfarin, which was the comparator, has a risk of at least about to about 3% of major bleeding complications if patients were to stay on it on a per year basis. So up to 3% of patients may suffer from a potentially life-threatening bleed for which they will have to seek medical in, uh, attention. And the first point of contact for a lot of these patients presenting with bleed will obviously be in the emergency department. So this might be a typical patient that you see in your ED department. Female patient, chronic atrial fibrillation on a drug called rivaroxaban who presents with melina and comes in a hemoglobin level of 6.5. His PTT is 11, her PTT is 11.7, APTT is 35. And this might be a typical patient that you actually see. What are the, these issues, what are the issues that you have to address when you see this patient in the emergency department? I think a number of questions that are pertinent and that are relevant to you, of course, is number one, how do you as emergency uh, physicians assess this patient uh, who is bleeding and receiving a DORAC? 
when do you need to reverse the effect of the direct, and you, indeed you do need to reverse uh, direct effects, how do you reverse the effect of the anticoagulant in order to try as best as you can to stem the bleeding for which this patient has suffered? So I think the first question we ask is, how bad is the bleed? Uh, in short, as far as uh, uh, emergency physicians are concerned, it is called triaging the patient. And there's no better uh, a group of medical personnel who is better at triaging. I believe that triage probably was invented by an emergency department physician. Am I not right? right? Because all of you are very good at triaging. So the same principle applies as far as a bleeding patient is concerned, whereby the first thing you do is to assess how bad the bleed is. Now, a very colloquial uh, Singaporean term, if you have the first category whereby the patient comes to see you, you might just give the expression, ah, yeah, this kind of bleed, you also want to come to the hospital because it is highly minor. And that will include, of course, patients presenting just with gum bleeding, a small bruise after they have knocked themselves or get into a small fight. They might have a URTI whereby they might blow their nose and they've got blood streaks in the sputum, or they may sometimes have small cuts and so on. These are what I would call nuisance bleeding. It's not just myself calling it nuisance bleeding. In fact, the term does exist in the literature whereby we refer them as nuisance. Right? As you might understand, when someone calls you a nuisance, it is never a compliment, but it also means that you're a little bit of an irritant, but you are actually quite harmless. Right? <laughs> so the same principle should apply if you get to see such kind of patients. Usually, you don't need to do anything. Just a reassurance that when you're on anticoagulant, you are expected to have a little bit of bleeding whenever you knock yourself and when you blow your nose, for example, nothing further needs to be done. The second category, of course, uh, the second column, of course, is what we call mild bleeding, whereby you might have nose bleeds that's a little bit more torrential. You sometimes get superficial hematomas or cuts and mild hematuria. In most instances, if they are mild, you don't need to stop even the anticoagulants. If it's a little bit of concern to the patients, you might just withhold a dose of the anticoagulants Reassure the patient, and once the bleeding, of course, uh, stops, the patient can probably reassume the uh, anticoagulant uh, at the usual dose. But of course, they have to see their primary physician for the bleeding uh, um, manifestation to be, um, to be assessed to see whether further investigation is necessary. Especially, for example, if you do get hematuria, whereby you do need to assess whether there are stones and so on. The last two categories, of course, are the ones that we are concerned with, whereby the bleeding is either severe. <clears throat> like, for example, frank hematuria or spontaneous large hematomas, or even a stable GI bleeding without hemodynamic instability, or the very last column, of course, what we would call life-threatening bleeding, whereby it's bleeding into critical sites, like, for example, in the brain, or bleeding uh, into the GI tract with hemodynamic instability. Right. So as I previously mentioned, for mild bleeding, you don't necessarily need to do very much for the patients except to stop if necessary, and you restart the anticoagulants if they're once bleeding is stopped, and of course where possible, and if necessary, you look for alternative process if the bleeding persists. The kinds of patients that come to the emergency department whereby you really need to pay close attention to would be, of course, a severe or life-threatening bleeding. Right. Kinds of patients that present to you, obviously, with bleeding that is life-threatening, you institute general measures, and all of you will be very familiar with this, whereby, of course, you would put in an IV excess for the patient, correct hypovolemia, and, of course, if there's an obvious bleeding source, mechanical compression is always a good thing to do for the patient to try to stop bleeding. You also need to decide for yourself whether there's a need for you to call a surgeon for procedures, depending on where the site of the bleeding is. Because if it is, for example, a GI bleeding, and you think that it's torrential in origin, or it is an intracranial bleed, obviously you need to call the neurosurgeons or the endoscopists or the surgeons to come in. And of course, time is wasted if you do not activate these colleagues of yours who are absolutely essential for the subsequent care of these groups of patients. Now, recognizing also that there will be other things that you need to look at, uh, a group of us, of course, back in about three years ago, came up with this consensus recommendation for physicians in Singapore to deal with patients who present with bleeding complications. And of course, we, we came up with a checklist of the items that you need to go through whenever you have a patient that comes in with severe or life-threatening bleeding. And I'll take you quickly through the list of recommendations or checklists that we have for the patients. The first question that you always would have to ask, of course, is which anticoagulant the patient is on. Now, while we're on the subject of the thorax, of course, we always remember that the same principle will apply to any other groups of patients who comes in with anticoagulant uh, therapy. And so some of you who are not from Singapore, of course, Fonda Paranox is available in your jurisdiction itself. And while I say that the, uh, the, novel, uh, the, the, the thorax or the norax are no longer novel, 
But of course, we still do get some situations whereby drugs with the names dabigatran, apixaban, and rivaroxaban are confused with other medications and are not recognized as anticoagulant in the first place. And you always must remember to stop the anticoagulants. I think while this does not apply to you in the emergency department, it is not unusual for patients to go back to the ward and for the doctors to continue prescribing the medications and the nurses to stop to continue serving them because they did not recognize that this is an anticoagulant. Now, it's essential, of course, for you to ask. The first question, of course, is when was the last dose of the drug was, was taken? For a number of reasons. If you have a patient coming in with a DOAC or an, a, a NOAC, Knowing when the last dose is taken might allow you, of course, to limit gastrointestinal obstruction, especially if the ingestion was less than three hours. In Dabigatron, of course, there's been published literature uh, that shows that if you use activated charcoal and the dose that you usually use, of course, is 50 uh, grams of charcoal, uh, within three hours of the ingestion, it may help limit the absorption of Dabigatron. And while there's no good quality evidence for the use of activated charcoal in rivaroxaban or pixaban, I would, use, I would still continue recommending the use of activated charcoal if the patient gets to the hospital within three hours of the last ingestion of the NOAX. Now, knowing when the last dose was taken also allows you to estimate the duration of the effect of the NOAX. The half-life of most of the NOAX is usually approximately about 12 to 17 hours. So knowing when the last dose was taken also gives you some idea as to what is the likely drug level. This, of course, is in contrast to warfarin. When you have a patient coming in with bleeding who's on warfarin, we don't usually bother asking when the last dose is because the effect of the warfarin is long-lasting and the effect of warfarin on reducing clotting factors production, of course, is, uh, is um, a constant and does not uh, become a factor in managing the patients unlike the NOAX. And obviously, of course, if you do have the occasional patients on low molecular weight happening and so on, it permits the calculation of reversal agents of protamine sulfate if you know when the last dose of anticoagulant was taken. An essential question, of course, is asking whether the patient may be on antiplatelet agents. We do know our cardiology colleagues, especially when the indication is uh, appropriate, will start our patients on antiplatelet agents despite them using an, 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 or, an anticoagulant. And of course, it, by doing so, of course, it compounds the risk of bleeding. So if indeed the antiplatelet agents is on board, find out what antiplatelet agents is. Obviously, you need to stop them. It's also useful for you to know what is the modality of action of the antiplatelet agents, in principle, whether they are irreversible or they are reversible agents. So drugs like aspirin, clopidogrel, and prasugrel are irreversible plate inhibitors of platelet function, which means that as long as the platelets are exposed to it, they no longer can regain the function. And normally, of course, you have to wait out at least five to seven days before the platelets that are functional is of su sufficient number to control the uh, uh, bleeding complications that the patient has. So indeed, if you have a patient who comes in with bleeding and who is on antiplatelet agent and you, it is essential for you to consider whether you need to give the patient platelet transfusion because even though the platelets are normal in number, they may not be functional. The one, of course, uh, antiplatelet agents that's reversible, which is new, of course, is decagrelo. If you do have a patient with decagrelo, it is potentially reversible. So if the patient has already stopped decagrelo for at least about 24 hours or more, you may not necessarily need to deal with the problem of platelet dysfunction induced by antiplatelet agents. Now, a full blood count, of course, can be obtained within usually a, a short period of time. It's essential for you to know what the hemoglobin is because it may give you an idea of the severity of the bleed. Now, obviously, a patient who comes in with a hemoglobin level of 6.5, as opposed to, come, uh, to another person who comes in with 11, there's a big difference in the amount of, of bleeding that the patient has, especially if you have the benefit of comparing the hemoglobin level to a recent blood level. And you find that the recent hemoglobin level is normal, but it's now low at about 7 or 8. This patient has uh, obviously bled a substantial amount over a short period of time. We also know that if you have anemia, it impairs oxygen carrying capacity. So besides resuscitating the patient and correcting the patient, you need to consider whether you need the patient to give the patient a blood transfusion on a reasonably urgent basis. And of course, if you do a full blood count, you obviously can look at the platelet numbers. And if there's concomitant thrombocytopenia, which is not induced by the uh, NOACs, you have to consider whether you need to give platelet transfusion for this patient, even if the patient is not on an antiplatelet agent. Now, the issue, of course, of interpreting the PT and the PT is much more complicated uh, than it is. Right? Here, of course, we're asking about, is there any coagulation test that it will allow us to assess what is the extent of the anticoagulant effect of the NOACs? 
As I said, that is much more complicated because it very much depends on the NORACs that you are using as well as the assay for which the lab is actually using. And I can only summarize it, of course, and to say that at least in the Singapore setting, we know that the labs, in, or what are the assays that the laboratories in Singapore use for various hospitals and so on. So we have all been able to summarize this in table form that helps the clinician. And the way it goes, of course, is that if you do have a patient who, who is on the NOAC and you need to interpret the PT, you find out which of the uh, anticoagulants the patient is on, which hospital you are working with, and based on that, of course, you have we've recommended for some interpretation. Same thing goes for the PTT as well. But by and large, if we were to look at routine coagulation tests and direct levels itself, the best test for dabigatran, of course, is the thrombin time. And the thrombin time is a highly sensitive test for the uh, presence of dabigatran in patients. If you have a patient who is bleeding in the hospital, I think the pertinent question as far as the Dorax are concerned is whether does this patient have substantial amounts of dabigatran that's present in the blood or not, right? And dabigatran doesn't give you an idea of how high the blood levels of, uh, the, um, of dabigatran is. Or rather, the thrombin time doesn't give you an idea of the blood levels of dabigatran. But if you do have a normal thrombin time, it tells you that this patient probably does not have any significant amounts of dabigatran in the system. So an example might be a patient who comes in with bleeding and the relatives of the patient tells you that I cannot remember when was the last dose I, I took. Or the relative says, I do not know whether he's taking dabigatran or not. And if you were to do a thrombin time, it shows that it's normal. This patient probably does not have dabigatran in the system. Right, so it cannot be used to measure the levels, but it gives you an idea of whether dabigatran is available or not. As far as rivaroxaban and apixaban, it has no effect on the thrombin time. So do not order a thrombin time if your patient is on rivaroxaban and apixaban. And the normal PT and the PTT does not exclude significant levels of drugs in the system for rivaroxaban and apixaban. If you indeed need to look at drug levels, you need to use specific anti-10A assays, not the anti-10A assays that you use for low molecular weight happening, but specific anti-10A assays which are not readily available in most hospitals in Singapore and for that matter in various parts of the world. Right. Ask yourself whether the patient's renal function is normal because most of the norex, of course, are excreted by the kidneys. So if you do have renal impairment, it prolongs the effect of the norex in the circulation. It is essential, of course, that you get a liver function test as well because if you find that there is liver dysfunction, besides the uh, effects of the NOAC, you need to think about whether there is also concomitant uh, reduction of clotting factors and so on. And if there, indeed there were liver dysfunction in a patient who is bleeding, you may have to consider whether you have to give fresh frozen plasma to replace clotting factors that are deficient. In all other instances whereby the liver function is normal, there is no role for giving fresh frozen plasma for a patient who is taking a NOAC. Now, if you have to ask yourself the question, or if you have to reverse the effect of the NOREX itself, the current status of reversal of NOREX goes like this. There is currently no approved reversal agent or antidote available in Singapore at the present moment. And if you do need to reverse it, you do need to use four-factor prothrombin complex, which is available in most of the uh, major hospitals in Singapore. And of course, in, in uh, certain situations, we would consider the use of fiber, which is a, a factor eight inhibitor bypassing agent, uh, agent that we use for patients with hemophilia with inhibitors, or recombinant factor seven A, which of course we are more familiar with because the trauma surgeons sometimes use this to improve hemostasis by increasing thrombin generation. Can you remove the norex by other means? Yes, if you are using dabigatran by hemodialysis or by hemofiltration, especially with a charcoal filter, but of course, in an emergency situation, this is usually not practical for you to organize a hemodialysis in a patient who is unstable. Low molecular weight happens from that paradox and oral factor 10A inhibitors, which is apexaban and rivaroxaban, are not dialyzable. So even if you have a chance of dialyzing the patient on rivaroxaban or apexaban, it does not work in removing the anticoagulant. What's coming up next? Are there uh, antidotes or reversal agents that are available? The answer is yes. There's either rucizumab, which is a sp specific reversal agent for dabigatran, and there's andesonate alpha, which is a specific reversal agent for factor 10A inhibitors. And of course, the third agent that is currently, of course, in, under the test phase is arizapine, which is a, a touted to be a universal antidote for all anticoagulants. Among the three, the one that has come on, to, on stream in some markets, of course, is uh, Ida Rizuzumab, which has been tested 
uh, under a program called the Reverse AD, which is a multi-center trial. And the multi-center trial, of course, has two groups of patients, whereby one group is with uncontrolled bleeding, another group is patients who do not have bleeding but undergoing emergency surgery. And, and Adarizumab is given as a 5-gram dose uh, in two doses over 15 minutes, and in the study itself, it shows that, of course, it's highly efficacious in reducing the levels of, of dabigatran uh, 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 in the blood once it's given, and it stops bleeding in the clinical trial. As far as endosinate is concerned, uh, or rather, uh, as, far, as far as uh, um, um, Idarizumab is concerned, it is now approved for use, of course, in the U.S. as well as in uh, some European countries, but it's currently not available in Singapore except for a clinical trial whereby three major hospitals are participating. And this it, Alpha, of course, has been published, of course, in uh, Healthy Volunteers in the New England Journal uh, of Medicine. It shows that, of course, it's effective also in, re in reducing the, uh, the uh, dose of uh, rivoxaban as well as apixaban itself, but it has to be given as an infusion. So in my, my, um, my last slide, if you do have to reverse NOAX in Singapore today, what are the options that you can use? For Dabigatran, you can consider enrolling them in the reverse AD study, which is still running in Singapore General Hospital, Changi Hospital, and NUH, if the patient were to present in this hospital. But if you are not in working any of these hospitals and you have to reverse any of the NOACs at this point in time, consider the use of four-factor prothrombin complexes, activated uh, prothrombin complex, which is fiber or recombinant no uh, Nova 7 at a dose of 90 micrograms per kilogram. And with that, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you.